Hey, hey, we're back with another episode of Revival Cast. Uh, it's a holiday weekend. We've got Indigenous People Day tomorrow, so it's just uh, Cheshire and me here for you guys uh, today. Um, and we're going to talk about um, the blog, of course, which was about the day in the life of a cabineer, caravaneer, and um, uh, that's Paro, um, hence the title of our... Uh, episode, Poor Poor Paro, um, and uh, we'll also delve into some of the um, topics on the forums. I know a big one for uh, for Cheshire is um, necromance again, um, and uh, we've got Ombla in chat. Uh, we've got Donnie Ergo. I've got to get Donnie Ergo on here sometime. Ah, okay. We're going to have to have a talk about that, Donnie Ergo, um, and um, let's see. Just make sure um, you have a shirt on when you show up. <laughs> um, anything interesting happened in IRC? Were you in IRC this week? I was in IRC this week. Let's see what has happened in IRC. I am totally drawing a blank on IRC right now. No. Um, we had a, a, a cool topic on the forums this morning, I think, which was... Um, it was common knowledge vs. uncommon knowledge, and yeah. it was kind of asking about uh, what happens when stuff makes it to the wiki. And uh, those of you who may not be paying attention to the forums yet, um, there's a separation between um, player knowledge and character knowledge that the devs are trying to work on. Um, one of the examples that came up in this um, forum topic today was, um, it's about what happens when players place knowledge up on the wiki and so you already know things in the wiki and one of the examples that was given was mushrooms so if you uh, idea was that if somebody puts up the different types of mushrooms place mushrooms versus non-poisonous mushrooms up on the wiki then players know which mushrooms to avoid but I think one of the ways to handle that is to um, have it so that it's not the like all mushrooms are poisonous, but what makes them non-poisonous is your character knowledge. And when you're starting your character is cooking or using the mushrooms, it's their knowledge that determines whether or not the mushrooms remain poisonous. So I think there's still ways for the devs to work out the difference between player knowledge and character knowledge. Um, just because your character may know that uh, these mushrooms are poisonous doesn't mean that they know how to make them non-poisonous. Uh, there's that. Um, let's see. I think in the past they've also mentioned that there may be uh, differences uh, between servers as well. So what may be a poisonous mushroom on one server may be harmless on another. Another thing I was thinking of was uh, in regards to like using mushrooms as an ingredient for something is that it could be harmless on its own but when mixed with a certain other ingredient, it may unleash a toxic property as well. So, um, like uh, like mustard gas, it's made from relatively simple home materials, but uh, when combined, you get a toxic cloud. So so much fun. Uh, <laughs> not at all. But, uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, you could do that with uh, mushrooms or what have you as well. Um, and that can also be different from server to server. Yeah, I think though, even there, you probably don't want because um, then you could just have different wikis for each server, and that, right? And, <laughs> um, but I'm just saying, there's I, I don't know what the devs will actually do, but there are things that if we can think of stuff, the devs can certainly think of stuff. I I think that there's going to be ways to make it so that. Your character knowledge is different than the player knowledge, and the wikis aren't going to be as useful as what we're normally um, used to. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, unless you had anything really, I mean, we're going to get into necromancy a little bit later, but unless you had anything um, else, I was going to dive into the blog real quick, was uh, Day in the Life of a Caravaneer named Paro. Um, and um, so one of the things I was thinking about too, we have to think about, we, we've normally been talking about how we don't have classes 
in revival, but we do have these professions, and we also do have um, master professions. And the master professions are kind of opened up or unlocked based on uh, the combination of skills that we've mastered. Um, and I think last week they mentioned Druid. Um, so I'm not sure that Caravaneer, we didn't really get um, skills in this, um, in this blog. Uh, it was more like circumstances. Um, so Paro is a brewer. Um, and what else does he? He has a vineyard. And he's yep. got some, uh, he's got, he had, he had some horses um, and a cart. <laughs> um, yep. So maybe brewing and distilling would be part of his skills, but I don't know um, if, if uh, these skills are going to unlock Caravaneer. I think not. I don't think the brewing stuff really has anything to do with right. it, but uh, willing to bet uh, things like logistics probably does. If, Caravaneer is, in fact, a master profession skill, which it seems like it might be. Um, I think it's more. I think it's more broad than that. I th um, maybe a math. Maybe it's just a profession, but not a master profession. Um, maybe because I think you know it, it could be um, logistics makes more sense. That's more broad, right? You could use that. That's about um, um, commanding people or managing the people that you have. Uh, probably like getting her. from one place to another, um, but um, you know that you could have all kinds of uh, right uh, um, product that you might be trying to ship. So um, could be uh, textiles or uh, right? Isn't there also um, logging? Like maybe you want to you have logs that you've got to move from one place to another, and you're going to do that by caravan instead of by river or ocean or something i don't know possibly um but one thing go ahead well one thing i was wondering about was uh that he had an agent and i'm wondering because logistics is supposed to be about uh it's also supposed to be about the amount of like npcs you can control i wonder if the agent falls under that or if they are like an independent thing you just they they still do their own thing they're not under your command they just provide a service in exchange for money kind of deal or if uh that does fall under logistics uh it, it's kind of murky to me mm -hmm. um whether how many that agents, agents how many agents you can have would probably be a factor of logistics um, possibly yeah but um yeah i mean at that point um so he has an uh, uh paro lives answer. in um in valor and he uh, has business set up in Fall Creek. Fall Creek is quite a ways away. Um, he had sent uh, um, some beer, I guess. Uh, Malomel, is that the name of it? Uh, um, oh. That kind of, of ale or beer or alcohol. Um, he did that to Fall Creek, but... He has not heard back yet. He's looking up in the skies to see if his uh, messenger pigeon will uh, let him know that it's arrived and he hasn't received anything yet. Um, and, um, and so he has an agent in Fall Creek that will give him reports about uh, what is um, prosperous mm -hmm. to sell, I guess, in, in Fall Creek. That's kind of a... The basic information. Um, he's decided that enough of his shipments have been stolen along the way to Fall Creek that he's um, no longer going to do business there, and he's thinking he should go to the caravan house, who's uh, kind of the middleman between Paro and the agent, and uh, he's going to um, terminate that contract yeah, there. Yeah. Snipe Hunter uh, responded saying that uh, agents are under the logistic logistic skill mm -hmm. so they count towards your uh 12 uh yeah. minions i guess <laughs> yeah um yeah um i'm uh, seeing something else coming on but to a little earlier uh caravanera is more like an occupation than a mechanical profession um 
host of related skills, but they aren't bound up in a master profession like Druidism is, which is, yeah, like I thought. Um, you might branch out into other things as you get more skin in the game, but logistics is an important one uh, across the board. Yeah. Right on. Hmm. Uh, let's see. The messenger pigeon thing uh, was interesting to me, too. So long-distance communication is a thing in revival it's just uh not instantaneous which is awesome so uh i'll, right. I'll look forward to that i'm kind of curious if there's a way to intercept that like if you uh trained hawks or whatever to go and capture pigeons or whatnot that'd be pretty cool uh yeah i mean that's thinking um there should be tools for um for, and by tools, I'm talking spells or um, objects or like the messenger pigeon. Um, but there should be tools for um, for far speaking, um, whether it's a crystal ball, uh, forms of divination, um, some kind of spell, or um, the messenger pigeon. So yeah, I've been thinking that there should be some form of long distance communication. It's just not going to be as easy as we're used to in um, in most games. I think somebody had mentioned whether or not you could, you know, open, a, keep a global chat of um, uh, multi-person chat open for uh, long periods of time. But I think that that would, if it's coming through some kind of spell, that's probably going to be depleting ether in a way that uh, we aren't going to be able to do that too easily. So messenger pigeon sounds like a, a great method. Um, yeah, that uh, it definitely seems like something interesting. Um, huh. At least. So Omboy is saying that the car the, the carry, uh, the messenger pigeon is kind of tied to the caravan. So uh, the caravans carry a pigeon. When it arrives at the caravan house, it um, it's sent and it'll be released to come back to you. That's kind of cool. Okay. Hmm. That is interesting. So I guess the pigeon isn't much of a long-distance communication <laughs> device. <laughs> I mean, we'll have to see what other things you can put on the carrier pigeon as your as your messenger pigeon as you're um, sending the caravan. Maybe that's part of the mail packet that goes along with, uh, with the caravan, right? I don't know. Um, and so, uh, so let's see. So um, Paro is really hoping that he's going to receive uh, some message. He keeps looking up to the skies but doesn't get anything. Um, and he's deciding that uh, bandits have uh, intercepted the, um, the caravan. So that means that he's lost the horse is he's lost the cart um, and he's lost whatever products he's had on the cart um, and he's going to need a way to uh, it would be nice but I guess that he would have some of that insured um, but uh, it would be nice if he can uh, recoup some of those losses right? Sounds like he had a backup plan he's thinking in the blog it said he was storing those uh, casks that he's trying to sell now uh, for a rainy day situation like this, um, something I guess to uh, get back on his feet real quick with something he knows will sell for a lot real fast. Um, so that seems to be what he's doing now. He's going to a new market, Crowns Rock, I believe, with these uh, casks that he's been saving up. And he's going to see if he can get his uh, foot in the door in the new market. Well, at least that's the impression I got. Yeah. And, um, and it seems like he's thinking that he would have done better if he had gone himself. But, again, we didn't get enough skills associated with this for me to get an idea of why he thinks he would do a better job than... Uh, uh. I think that's uh, something the devs have said before is that uh, players have like a higher potential skill wise than NPCs can get to. Like, yeah, you'll have like a few 
master NPCs out there, but general NPC hirelings that you'll get probably, you know, in the middle tier skill wise, whereas you, the player, is probably going to be a bit higher than yeah, your own Yeah, but I hirelings. just don't know what skills he, he's going to be using that, that will get uh, him there. That's what I'm saying. There are, supposedly, there's a negotiation skill. I don't think I've got them added to my skill list yet on the forms. Uh, but once I definitely see what the hard uh, negotiation skills are, I'll definitely see about getting them on there if I haven't got them on yet there yet. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I don't know. That means that uh, he he thinks that he would be able to negotiate with the bandits better. I don't know what that means exactly. But um, um, yeah. So this is the third time it says in three months that. Uh, the, um, that he's lost stuff, which is why he's decided he's going to go ahead and go to Crown's Rock himself. Now, somebody was wondering about um, blessings and bandits and uh, how that's going to work for uh, people who are traveling uh, from one place to another. If they have blessings, if blessings are going to last long enough uh, day by day. Uh, to get them where they need to go without being attacked by bandits or by um, PvP. Um, and um, I forget which, uh, I think it was Copper Dragon who was um, replying and saying some of the same things that I was thinking. Um, I forget which thread it was in at the moment, but um, unfortunately it was not in the caravan thread um, where it should have been. Um, I think it was in the PvP versus PvE thread, actually. Um, that sounds about right. And um, and yeah, so I was thinking these bandits, would they be able to have rituals um, that could uh, get rid of things? I that think the, that would be interesting. I don't think... Uh, there. I think the devs have said there's nothing like that right now. Like a way to counter the blessing. No, you can destroy uh, the temple. And if well, you're yeah, far, there's if you're, that. But if not, you're far enough away from the temple where you got the blessing, then um, yeah, it's going to be depleted. Just, uh, I think um, what Copper Dragon was talking about was something that I've brought up before about having some kind of counter blessing that allows you to ignore <laughs> the protection blessing, uh, like. Uh, Say what? What's that warrior? God's name, Barak, or something like that. Um, if you could get a blessing from him to attack somebody who wronged you, or something like that, despite them having a blessing protection on them, kind of deal. But I think they said there's nothing like that at the moment. Um, but who knows? Maybe that'll change. Um, um, depending on how the system actually proves to work when it comes out. Then uh, the other things to think about is uh, the different gods that are like along your way. So it's not necessarily going to be the, the gods that you God, want. Yeah. yeah. Um, along what the way. relationship yeah. is with those other gods. Exactly. And if there's even any shrines at all between point A and point B, you might have, you know, your god here and a god there, but on the road between it could be a long expanse no towns no temples nothing no shrines anywhere to get a, a blessing from there's also protective gargoyles but there might not be any along that particular road it depends on how well traveled the road is so um so there's also ocean travel we are on an archipelago yeah there ain't nothing out there <laughs> um, um so i don't think i th i think that uh it's most likely that there will be some push and pull in terms of PvP versus PvE. Um, and uh, uh, I think it was Snipe Hunter also mentioned that um, the Blessings will protect against PvP, but they won't necessarily protect against the caravan goods being stolen. So Yeah, so like the cart driver, he might be safe. But the cart he's on isn't safe. <laughs> and, and so, again, this is kind of like with EverQuest Next. We have to um, be specific and talk about the blessings protecting from PvP combat. Mm -hmm. um, but player versus player stealing somebody's 
stuff is also a form of player versus player conflict. Um, so, um, I haven't seen a shrine in a while, guys. <laughs> um, yeah, someone could have made an effort to strip that section of road as well. Yeah, so um, we'll just see what happens. But I don't think I don't think any of it is going to be as simple as we normally expect things to be in MMORPGs. Oh yeah, um, this is going to be interesting. I am looking forward to it. <laughs> um, oh, we got a little bit of. Uh, of some flavor of uh, valor with the canals and taking mm -hmm. a uh, like what, it, what was it called? It was like a valet boat. So yeah, uh, sounds a lot like uh, Venice uh, yeah. with the uh, gondola yeah. uh, guys there. So that that's that's kind of neat. Uh, gondola taxis going through Valir, um, or you could just travel on foot like you did later on with it. What she had to do with this cart. Gondola can't carry a cart. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we, they spoke a little bit about that, the sizes of the ship uh, in relation to your carts. And um, even once he gets to, to the docks, he's got to find someone who has a ship big enough that can take his medium-sized cart and a couple of horses uh, on it along with all the other people, I guess. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll have to see what kind of bargains... Um, We'll have to make what the negotiations for that is like because, um, you know, it might be more expensive if you need to make room or if you want to be the only person on the ship, maybe you can buy out the whole ship, right? <laughs> uh, Privacy, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it'll be interesting seeing how a uh, player and Player on player and player on NPC or even NPC on NPC negotiations go. Uh, I've been watching um, X Factor. Uh, both um, UK and Australia, I think, are going right now. And it's uh, the five chair challenge in Australia, I think, and the six chair challenge in the UK. And so um, uh, they've got like 24 singers. Uh, and they've got to whittle them down um, to six chairs. And so the person will like, yeah, you're great, you're great, you're great. And they'll get six people in the chair. And then some other great singer will sing. And they're like, no, I have to have you. So I have to kick somebody out of this chair. And you're going to take their spot. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, you go to the ship and you think that you've made your negotiation and you get to go. And then somebody else comes along and says, ah, a better twice deal. as much. I'll pay you twice as much to kick him off and give me a spot. I don't know if that'll happen, but it sounds like it's a possibility. Definitely sounds like it could happen, yeah. Swap, swap, they suck. Um, <laughs> oh, well. Um, yeah, because this said that uh, Paro first went to a player um, shipwright or, you know, uh, mm -hmm. person the guy to, to try and get them on. Yeah. And, was rude to him back, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, Hopefully there's enough options. I mean, we just have to see how many people are there, how long do you wait, um, what other kinds of uh, what other kinds of contracts can you make with the caravan house? I mean, the uh, kind of a opposite situation is probably also true because I mean, in his situation, there wasn't a whole lot of boats to pick from, but in a place that does have a lot of ships currently in port, uh, he might be trying to find. Hey, I'll pay this much to go on a trip and one boat got one uh, ship captain was like sure we'll take you for that much but another one might put in be like i'll take you for half of that <laughs> so that cool. yeah. um and hopefully your negotiation skills and all that stuff will will help with that um uh so what else was happening oh we so we so we have some names because uh, this is one of the things that I like too. We've got Spiced Reserve is the name of his um, other shipment that he's taken, mm -hmm. Crowns Rock. Um, I'm hoping that we've got a lot of uh, great names for our food and drink, um, especially as we're adding different ingredients. And um, you know, we've got Spiced Reserve. Will we have Unspiced Reserve? What what will we Seems have? Seems like it. Uh 
a while back when they were talking, I believe they they did a cooking blog, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the examples was for a like a pie. And then there was a spiced pie variant because she added in like pepper or something like that. So yeah, the uh, the names of a dish can change depending on what you do to it. Uh, same probably could sit, be done with uh, wines and uh, mead and all that fun stuff too, and the brewing uh, skill, which I believe they have been talking about on the forums the past day or two. Um. Uh, I'll see if I can pull that one up. <laughs> mini games for or mini games thread, yeah. They, uh, talking about a little bit of that, and uh, one there was one little neat bit from that thread I saw was uh, the time certain things take. Mm -hmm. Like farming, you're not going to be planting, growing, and harvesting crops in a day. <laughs> Uh, unlike other professions where you could sit down, start to finish something in one session, boom, done. Uh, some some skills out there, it's going to take weeks, months <laughs> to actually finish something. So Yeah, that's why when you and uh, Onomaru were talking to me about not being able to have 19 alts, and you were saying, like, if you're a farmer, I'm like, why, why are you picking farm? Like, I'm not going to... My alts are not going to be farmers. Like, that's going to take a long time. My alts are pretty much going to be doing things that don't take a long, a long time. That's why I can have 19. Um, yeah, I expect farming to, to, to take a few days to raise some crops, at least. I think it's going to take a lot more than a few I'm days. Just saying, it's, uh... at, at, at least, you know, corn doesn't grow in a day. Squash doesn't grow in a day. Um, Let's see. The time scale is three to one. Uh, so what? Uh, it harvesting goes from what spring to fall kind of deal normally. So you're you're looking you at what? At least three months for something to grow before you harvest it. At least three months, if not six months. Yeah, you're Four you're months, looking uh, at. You're going to only have three harvest in a whole year, it looks like. <laughs> so, uh, have fun with that farming, guys. <laughs> I do not have the patience for it. I, I tell you, I do not have the patience for that. But for those of you out there who do, awesome. Good luck with well, that. Well, <laughs> I mean, I think we're going to, I, I think it's not going to take as much time as real time. I think the same thing is for breeding, right? If we're breeding animals, I don't think we're going to have to wait. Uh, actually a year or six months or all that what it, however long it takes to gestate a cow or a horse i don't think we're going to actually have to wait that length of game time um but we'll see um what else was going on in the blog in the blog um i think that was about it um some people are worried about how uh, Bantry is going to impact the economy, but I'm not a real player of the economy person, so yeah. I really have no clue. Yeah, um, how bandits affect the economy? Well, uh, for one, if they're constantly stealing particular shipments, like say there's a big iron trade going between uh, Crown's Rock and Valir, because we know Crown's Rock has iron. Uh, but there's pirates out there who are specifically targeting the iron shipments. That's going to crank up those iron prices real quick, um, especially if those pirates aren't also selling to uh, <laughs> where those uh, uh, shipments are supposed to be heading anyways. Um, there's that. Um, also, you got to think that uh, there could be some unscrupulous merchants out there who may actually hire bandits to target their uh, competition as well. Yeah, uh, there's going to be guards. They're going to, I mean, there's going to be all manner of guards that are going to be jumping in that, to prevent that's that. Also so. part, that's also part of the PvP too. You can hire guards. Uh, yeah. Some of them can be player guards to protect yeah. your shipments as well. So, uh, depending on level of organization between the merchants and the bandits uh, things can tip either way pretty quick um, 
Uh, that'll be, definitely be something I'm looking forward to seeing as well. I'm probably, I don't think I'll be too heavily involved in it myself. Um, uh, raiding caravans is kind of neat, but not totally what I'm going for uh, right now. So, uh, But it will be interesting to see how that affects the world economy as it evolves. Um, let's see. Uh, Snipe Hunter just posted something in that thread we were talking about with the long wait jobs. He says that even though, yeah, there is a long wait, there are still things you can do uh, like daily to help optimize uh, the process to make a better end product when it finally is time to harvest or finish brewing or whatnot. So it's not like you're just not doing anything for a couple of weeks or months. <laughs> you, yeah, you but still no, have things if, to do. If I'm breeding a horse, I'm not going to want, you know, to have to do actually one or two in-game years trying to work on developing this horse. That's <laughs> even if I'm doing something every day, that's that's not enough to make me want to breed a horse. That's not fun. Yeah. Still, I think it's fun to some people out there, I would think. Not me. I'm too impatient. Honest, way, way too impatient. If something hasn't blown up today, I'm doing something wrong. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, um, let's see. What else we got? That's pretty much it. You were saying that uh, economy isn't really something that you are into, but Necromancy is something that you are into, so we can uh, jump over to uh, Necromancy now. All right, so there have been a lot of developments in uh, Necromancy over the past uh, two weeks, actually. Uh, I've been talking with the devs a lot about it. Um, Uh, Because you were inspired by Ark, I believe, to uh, start this guild. That's mm-hmm. devoted to. Is it devoted to necromancy? Mm-mm. It's uh. What's the, what's the focus the, of the guild. The oh, guild. Immortality. Yes, immortality. Oh, necromancy might be one component. Yeah, there's uh. He's going for alchemy. I'm going for necromancy, because um, both have been suggested as possible avenues to immortality. But there's probably a bunch of others out there, so. Any ideas other people can come up with? I mean, they're willing. Uh, we're willing to accept anybody who's willing to help us pursue that goal. Um, another thing that's been mentioned is that immortality is probably not something that'll be like uh, um, something you could reproduce necessarily. Like uh, what works for one person probably won't work for everybody else to get immortality. So by pooling our resources together, we're kind of opening up as many avenues as possible. Or that's what the plan is. So we can get as many people immortal as possible within our guild. Um, yeah, you'll be exploring necromancy. I'll probably, odds are, I'll probably go looking into lichdom or something like that. Um, another thing was mentioned uh, today. Uh, talking in the necromancy thread was the possibility of necromantic packs as well. Like uh, Snipe Hunter in the past has mentioned that necromancers can speak to the dead and communicate with them. Well, say some bandits killed one of these poor merchants, right? Uh, And I happened to come across the merchant's corpse. I could speak to the corpse, find out he was killed by bandits, and be like, hey, I'll bring you back as a... uh, undead whatever so you can go hunt down these bandits and uh, the player or NPC whatever might actually agree to that this is just a theory we've had uh, we came up with this morning discussing on the forums who's we? Uh, me and let's see let me get back to that thread there was I think two other people commenting on that Uh, here we go um. Yeah, there's a uh, Thurin. I think he might be new to the forums. Yeah, only five posts. <laughs> and uh, er- Erasmus, who's been around for a little bit. Uh, we were talking about it, and uh, I think it would be kind of a 
cool idea because uh, what I was thinking of is that instead of the necromancers puppeteering the undead in this case, I give this guy his free will to pursue his revenge. But with this type of ritual, it could be like a temporary undeath thing. Like he'll only be back for a couple days to try and pursue his revenge. Uh, but he could come back to me, the one who brought him back, and I could recharge him, so to speak, in exchange for services rendered. Uh, I think that would be kind of a, a neat uh, relationship there <laughs> uh, for uh, a necromancer to pursue. Um, let's see. And uh, a bunch of other things were brought up, too. Um, there yeah, are I intelligence. That, I think that sounds to me like it wouldn't be so much of a pact, though. That would be... Um, that would just be a temporary uh, skill, kind of like um, madness, I guess, where if you're uh, it's, it's, bringing somebody back from, if you're bringing back somebody back from the madness plane to the prime plane, uh, you can do that, but it's not going to keep them here indefinitely if they're still mad. They're going to be eventually be drawn back to the madness plane and I, I, yeah. I would imagine that there would be similar effects with necromancy where you would have temporary spells that would bring people back from the dead but it wouldn't necessarily be a permanent solution so they would still have to come to you but that's not quite the same thing as a pact the thing with uh, true pacts is that in revival they don't want to completely deny a player their freedom kind of deal uh, like a sleep effect or a stun effect is only going to last for a few seconds kind of thing. So a true pact kind of ties your hands. I might as well be puppeteering you at that point. You lose control of your character. They have to do my will in that case. This form of pact uh, it's like I can bring you back if you do this for me. You can choose not to do it. But when it comes time for, if you need more time to finish your task and you haven't done what I asked you to do, I'm not going to recharge you. <laughs> you're yeah, you're done. Really a, that's not really a pact. And, yeah. I mean, it's barely, it's an a, there. barely a contract. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think a deal. People, yeah, people yeah. will be doing that in any case, right? That's just normal gameplay. I just think that would be a, a neat. Uh, form of necromancy, a temporary free will uh, bring back that you could use on players and stuff. Get them out of anime's realm temporarily. <laughs> They'll be inhabiting their dead courts. I think that's likely to happen in any case. I think that's going to be uh, part of normal gameplay. Um, the, uh, but um, yeah, I mean uh, one of the things that I found compelling in the necromancy um, thread was the concept of uh, is having a good necromancer possible. Um, Revival doesn't really have objective good and evil, so um, what yeah, is your how, how, are you, how are you defining good? Because I don't think I think you have a subjective view of good. I don't think you have an objective view of... I don't th you you sit, seem to talk about good with a small g rather than good with a, a capital G. Um, uh, there are different views on it. Um, like, uh, I think it would still be, uh, a necromancer can be good if what they use their necromancy for leads to a good end. Uh, I, I think you're talking about the difference between kind or good with a small g versus good <laughs> with a large g, um, because there's stipulations there. Um, and what typically, uh, and it also depends on how the magic is defined. So what typically is in D and D is going to keep a necromancer uh, not good is that they're using um, they're using negative energy to revive the dead, and that is the opposite of healing energy, and is going to do things like if you're reviving, a, if you're if you're animating a zombie. The zombie is going to have zombie rot. That's going to cause a problem for living people. Um, and it's the same, right? If you're using negative, the negative, 
the the healing en energy that you use to heal people is the opposite of what's going to uh, animate the dead. And the same for what you use to animate the dead is going to be negative for living people. Um, and so the healing is good and the undead energy is evil. And that's I, uh... why it's difficult to have a good with a capital G necromancer. I've been uh, scouring the internet as a whole uh, for the past week now, trying to f just find examples of good necromancers. And suffice to say, they are very, very rare. <laughs> because even in... you can have a kind necromancer, which is what I think huh? you're, you're seeking. You there, kind I found good necromancers. Uh, one I already knew about, uh, Sabriel. Is a uh, there, there's a book series, uh, the Eporson trilogy, I think, is what it's called. Mm -hmm. The title character of the first book, Sabriel, is a good necromancer. How 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 is good defined? How is good defined? Well, she uh, helps the dead move on, rather than she's not the type of necromancer. That's specifically kind. Who, she's a kind necromancer. She's she saves the world. <laughs> right, so she's kind, but that's not necessarily the same thing as good. That's pretty damn good in my book. <laughs> good with a small g, but not big good g with there, it. buddy. No, no, not <laughs> she saves science, the world. She brings a petrified guy back, a that, guy who was that, turned to stone. That's irrelevant him back. in terms of in terms of D and D. Good with the capital G. So she's good with the small g, and she's kind, but she's not good because good has uh. reverence for life. And she has a reverence for unlife. It sounds no. Like. It's definitely life on her part. She's trying she's, to. But she's she's using. Is she dealing with the dead or with the undead? She's dealing with the. Uh, yeah, it's dealing with the dead, but it's not her. Like she's not. So much. She's not the type of necromancer who raises the dead. She's not creating zombies. She's the type that if she finds a zombie. She's going to enter like the spirit world or something, try to find the soul tied to that zombie, and lay them to rest. That's her type of necromancy. She's, but that uh, wouldn't, that wouldn't, so in, right. So you have to, to do this, you have to define how necromancy works, what necromancy is, what good is with the capital G. Um, I, uh, and so in D&D &D terms, she wouldn't be good. Mm, I think she would be. But, um,. I also did some digging into what necromancy is, real world necromancy anyways. And uh, historically speaking, a necromancer is just somebody who speaks to the dead. That's what they were. Um, uh, not just. It could be. That's pretty much what they were. It was later, much later, uh, more recent years that they started going into like they're bringing back the dead kind of deal. Or uh, in some cases, it's even saying that they're not bringing back the dead so much as putting demons into dead bodies. It's another concept that's also more recent. Mm -hmm. But for the longest time, they were just speaking to the dead kind of deal. Uh, uh, but uh, again, that depends on where, because that's not true if you're talking about uh, Egyptians with mummies. They weren't necessarily speaking to the dead. They were preserving bodies for... for the souls, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, um, the, the term necromancy actually uh, seems to have originated in the Bible, of all places. Um, so there I may it was be, Greek. The word is Greek, but uh -huh. the, uh, it was actually some, like, uh, it was used in the Bible as was when it was first used, but it's a Greek word. Or Greek-rooted word. It's a twisted Greek word, because um, I think it was uh, the Greek word is necromantia or something like that. But I'll didn't the Greeks back. already have before the Bible? Didn't the Greeks already have um, communicating with the dead? Yeah, the the word I don't think was coined until it was put into the one of the later Bible books or something. When uh, what was it? One there was a king in the Bible who wanted to speak to a dead friend. And a necromancer, a or a witch, I think she was originally called, who used necromancy to call back his dead friend, spirit, and uh, the spirit told of a f for like a divination, 
Uh, the spirit said, uh, basically said that, oh, by the way, since you brought me back, you're going to hell, buddy. <laughs> we may be friends, but this is bad. So you're going to hell kind of deal. Um, which wasn't exactly what the king was hoping to hear. But <laughs> um, anyways, yeah, there's a, like, there's definitely like what we consider modern day necromancy to include. Uh, Egypt, Egyptians practice would Egypt's practice would fall under that. Um, a lot of weird death practices around the world would fall under the modern scope of necromancy. But uh, well, I think it's the difference between D and D version of necromancy versus uh, other forms, other other D and D version of necromancy specifically. Okay. Sorry, that was a weird thing. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just uh, something I've been digging into. Uh, the term medium came up in my research as well. So why why um, why are you focused on whether or not a uh, necromancer can be good with the capital G versus good with the small G? Why, why do I think they can be good with a capital? No, why, do, why does it matter? Why does it matter? Yeah. I like exploring uh, these... Uh, the what, What's the word I'm looking for? I, the reason why I'm asking is because, like I said, you can have a kind necromancer. Yeah, why can't you have a good one? Depends on how you're... If it's good with the capital G, then there are factors in D&D that prevent that. But if you don't, if what you're not factors? using factors, so again, the, the type of uh, uh, divine energy that's being used to practice necromancy, uh, because it's not just the what, it's the how. Um, and um, also um, whether or not it's a reverence for life versus a reverence for unlife, because a reverence for life is going to be good, a reverence for unlife is going to be evil. Um, and that's just the objective definitions for good with the capital G and evil with the capital E in D&D specifically. But if you don't have those objective definitions, if you have, like Revival doesn't, then yeah, you can have a good necromancer with a small g. You can have a kind necromancer. That's, that's going to be easy. In Revival, again, it's just going to be dependent upon how the NPCs feel about um, the methods that you're using to interact with the dead um, and what the repercussions are. In, in my uh, searches, uh, a lot of discussions of D&D necromancy did come up. And one thing that was neat is that only clerics are restricted in that way. There are good wizards with necromancy spells, including animate dead in D&D. Uh, uh, what version? Because isn't it isn't isn't it evil? What's the descriptor on them? It has the evil descriptor on it. It does, but wizards are not restricted in with those tags. Only right. clerics you can, are. You can use them, but it should have a a consequence for using them. Wizards don't really seem to have that mechanically. Uh, uh, what do you mean by that mechanically? Because that's up to the DM, right? Uh, so you the can use them. Evil and good descriptor tags mm -hmm. are only there mechanically for determining for what the clerics can do. Those tags do not come up anywhere in the wizard rules, ever. Wiz uh, so wizards don't wizard, use them. If, if, if a wizard uses a necromancy spell, it doesn't come with the evil descriptor. It, uh, the spell itself still has the evil descriptor, but the wizard is not restricted by right, that but, tag. Right, but what that means is that if they're using something that's evil, the DM should be pushing them towards evil the more often they use something that is evil. That's the way it should work. It, so that it means that the wizard isn't impeded from mechanically from using the spell, but there are still consequences for using the spell because it's still evil. Yeah. The uh, another so their, uh, their alignment should start shifting the more they do something that's evil. Mm, possibly. 
again, I think it also goes back to the uh, does the ends justify the means thing they as don't. well. That's the whole point of having those objective things in in uh, in D and D. What do you the mean they purpose, don't? The purpose of having good and evil was to make it so that if you started making those kinds of choices where the ends are supposed to justify the means, your alignment starts shifting. That's what the DM is supposed to is supposed to do. Because you're compromising your morals. That's why they were there. Hmm. I don't know about that. Well, that's the way it was for 30 years. I don't know what it's <laughs> like in the last 10 years, but that's what it was like in the first 30 years. Three point, well, let's see, 3.0 and up. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. 3.0 changed quite a bit. So There's uh, also other lore to look at as well. Uh, the Elder Scrolls has, an, has examples of good necromancers as well. Uh, the Dunmer people, their, form of, their uh, view of necromancy is completely different from the Empire's view of necromancy, for instance. Yeah. And we should uh, expect that in Revival, I think. Yeah. The, um, oh yeah, definitely. Especially uh, if Kolaja for instance, does draw heavily on Egypt, as I suspect they might. Uh, Egypt even had an undead god. <laughs> Osiris was an undead god, um, among other things. But he was a good god in their pantheon. Um, there's also, back to the Elder Scrolls thing, um, the Dunmer view of necromancy is that I am not forcing the dead to work for me. I'm actually praying to my ancestors to come and save my ass right now. So, and the undead that arrive from that form of necromancy are that character's ancestors showing up to save them kind of deal. Um, and, uh, which is different from the imperial form of necromancy where they are like, yeah, soul, you're my bitch. Get in that uh, Get in that body. Well, but it's different because <laughs> there's a difference between animating dead and creating undead and resurrecting. Because if you're resurrecting somebody, you're drawing on healing and positive energy, and that's okay. Um, versus drawing on negative energy, um, which is going to create undead, and that's not okay. Um, but I think what we're going to have in Revival is a question of, um, like, flesh mending is probably good with a small g um flesh crafting might be questionable um and then uh you know if you're creating something um even if we're not speaking of undead if you create a chimera with uh flesh crafting or you create a golem um is that something that hylathia is going to condone hmm. um, because technically it might be life but she's probably closer to natural life versus unnatural life um, and so those are the kinds of things that you have to weigh which gods are, are helping you with the necromancy and uh, what is the god's vision of nature versus uh, supernatural not supernatural but I guess unnatural if um, if I had to take a guess on the Hylothe point there, I'm pretty sure she's probably against undead in general just because of the ugliness factor. <laughs> yeah, but I meant, I meant even, but uh, even with not golems, just undead. Yeah. Even golems, not just, I think there might be an exception there. Because well, uh, uh, with the golems, one, it, it can be a damn good looking golem. Two, what if they're using these golems in forms of performance art as well? That could be something she's really into. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it depends, but I, I think it's going to be because I think she's uh, over beauty, but I think it's beauty and nature. So if you're doing things that are unnatural, I think that could be an issue. Um, There's also Bass, who's yeah, another. Yeah, Umb was saying, Hylathi don't like no necromancy. Um, Hylath, they won't have an issue with golems, he also says. Mm hmm. So, uh, yeah. yeah, what about flesh golems? That's exactly the sort of... More <laughs> flesh <Yeah>. golems, well... <laughs> yeah, which is what I was thinking too, flesh golems. Um, and Chimera, again, it might not even just be 
undead, but there's all kinds of stuff that you can you could do. Um, yeah. it's striving for immortality. Okay. I that's, think of golem. I typically think of stone. Uh, no. There's that's, various that's, forms. There's various. There, there's forms. a lot of different forms In, of uh, golems. It's just the default one I think of is yeah. a statue that's animated kind yeah. of deal. But uh, flesh golems, yeah, I, I see that. D and D's got a ton of examples of different golems. I mean, I think there's even a snow golem in there somewhere. Basically, a snowman brought to life. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's a lot of weird golems out ideas out there. Yeah, I think I think it will be interesting to see if there are various forms of necromancy. Um, what kind of magic is being used to uh, to do that? Is there different forms of magic to communicate with the dead? Um, uh, divination versus necromancy, or does it have to be both? There's also um, the spirit stat, too, which supposedly allows you to interact with the dead as well. At least ghosts that are still around. So there's probably more than one way to talk to the dead. Um, as you suggested, divination, I have hardly any doubt that that'll possibly have a way of communicating with the dead or other things on different planes. Uh, necromancy, probably just limited to speaking to the dead, but hey, it's a way to communicate with the dead. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's a... I, I like thinking about the overlaps some skills will have in Revival. Like, yes, divination, you can perform divinations or communicate with things. Necromancy also has some of that, too. Uh, even with div divinations, uh, through uh, brain suddenly stopped working there. Um, Again, when I was looking at historical examples of necromancy, a lot of it would be like reading bones and stuff like that, calling in spirits to, you know, do stuff with bones. That's another form of necromancy, uh, mostly focused on things that have already happened, but some of it can also reveal uh, revel revelations to the future, like with the king in the Bible there. Uh, also, Odysseus in the Odyssey uh, ran into some of that as well. Right, so, because we had several different examples in the Plains Walking um, blog of the different ways that you can uh, initiate Plains Walking. Um, one of the ways was with incense. So it could be that communicating with the dead using incense um, would be a good way to do it, and using bones to communicate with the dead um, would be seen as evil um but uh yeah i don't know what wh where the devs are going to go with that um and again since it's not really objective good and evil in revival it's going to be more um it's going to be more subjective than that um but i wonder if that's going to be tied in with gods as well so that you know maybe it's the outer gods that require you to use bones or maybe it's uh, the elder gods that would use incense and that might be a determining factor in terms another, of something is more good than evil. Another thing I'd like to bring up about the difference between D&D &D necromancy and historic necromancy is that historic necromancy is the magic of both death and life. It's both. Whereas D&D &D, it's just death. <laughs> Uh, and they put life under conjuration or something like that. But, right. uh, yeah, um, if Revival's form of necromancy follows more the historical form of necromancy, uh, potential of life necromancers is there. Uh, and also, uh, I know Pathfinder did that too. There are life necromancers in Pathfinder. Uh, so yeah, it'd be interesting to see uh, where they go with it, and that would definitely have a big impact on whether uh, necromancers, as you say, can be good with a little G or a big G. I guess. <laughs> um, um was saying that uh, societies will have their opinions, but your karma will uh, be 
affected by what the gods think. Um, um, so we have questions. Did mm -hmm. we get questions in uh, Skype? Yep, they're on Skype. Um, do you want to read them? Uh, sure, I can read off the first one here. Uh, from Mother Rabbit. Can I have a messenger raven? I don't see why not. I mean, uh, with there are animal trainers out there. I could probably train a raven to do that. Ravens are pretty smart. <laughs> uh, it's a lot smarter than a pigeon. Uh, I, I could see that happening. Um, Snipe Hunter mentioned something interesting in chat. You can animate a skeleton, but it takes more effort than a muscled corpse would, which kind of makes a little bit of sense. Um, but I hadn't thought of it ever that way. That that makes uh, hmm. that's kind of interesting. It makes it makes sense because you have to have more magic to make the skeletons move without muscles. Um, and uh, Zero got the question answered by Omwa. I don't see which question that was. Um, ravens are hella smart, so uh, Snipe Hunter seems to be saying that um, <laughs> messenger ravens are likely. Probably, yeah. Let's see. So you're saying the Zero question was already answered? He says that, but All right. um, go ahead and read it. Uh, the question was, does anyone think Paro was being impatient? Has anyone heard since blog if there is a range of possible delay for said messenger birds? Essentially, could a bird have come a few hours after he left? I think it's possible, but... Um, Had, well, no, he hadn't been waiting for three months. He'd been stolen from in the span of three months. But, yeah, yeah we don't know how long he'd been waiting to see the messenger. For this most recent one? Yeah, we don't really know. Uh, it's possible uh, that the bird could have just shown up right after he left. <laughs> and his last shipment could have been just fine. But going with how his last few shipments have been, uh, ended up, uh, it's pretty reasonable that he was right on the money with his uh, guess that this latest one also got stolen. <laughs> this is a nice riff going over here. Uh uh, what if the raven pigeon hit a rainstorm or got shot down by a hunter or had to hole up in a tree? All kinds of stuff, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we just don't want to wait. Sometimes, yeah. Let's see. Um, next question, uh, also from Mother Rabbit. We talked about house golems, but can we create them to travel with our caravan? I don't see why not. Um, yeah, they would fall a under about uh, how smart we can make them, right? Hmm. Yeah, how smart a golem can be. I yeah, don't know. I think that would be the factor, right? I know with necromancy, it has been said there are both unintelligent and intelligent undead out there. Uh, yeah, I think you would want but them to golems. Be I don't know. Fairly intelligent, so they don't just wander off and do their own thing. Mm. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Um, so yeah, with the caravan thing, I think, yeah, a golem could be, tra could travel with the caravan. I mean, they count towards your 12 hireling minion, whatever count. Uh, so yeah, I think so. You could get them to do that. Let's see, another question from Mother Rabbit. Uh, let's see. And similarly, if I gain the trust of, say, a wolf, will he travel with me as well? Again, that's a pet, I would, I would assume. So, yeah, uh, I think that could also happen. Yeah, that's uh, if you have animal lore and um, you're able to train the wolf, then they'll travel. She's got a question at. for you as well, specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, Mother Rabbit, more for digs. If I use necromancy to talk to a doctor that came up with a cure for the plague but died before administering it, good or bad? Um, if you're, if you're using what I think of necromancy, then, and you're talking to a doctor, it doesn't matter, the, 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 uh, alignment would be good, the outcome, no, I mean, the alignment would be evil, it might be a neutral situation at best, but if you're using necromancy, necromancy is evil, so... Yeah, and 
just throw my two cents in there. I think it would be good. I mean, you're getting the cure from the dead doctor for this plague that's going on. Good you're saving a lot of lives. Uh, I'd still say that's a big G there. But, you know, we got our differences. <laughs> um, Let's see. And I think that's it for the questions linked in Skype. Um, we missing any? Let's nope, see. that I was think it. I think I saw a new question pop up in the chat, but that might have been the one for you that was just posted there. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't see it anymore anyways. All right. Well, we're over time. Um, next week we will have Valex back. He's done with his uh, work stint. Um, for the summer, so he should be back next week. Um, and what are we covering in the blog next week? I'm forgetting offhand. I'm actually drawing a blank too. Let me pull that up. Uh, da, 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 da. If somebody's going to beat me to it, but I'm going to look anyways. Kedrin's going to talk about population and difficulty right. scaling relative to location. Right. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, just how difficult things are going to be, I guess, in different regions. Um, and how fluid that's going to be, because what may be a hard region to get, a, get through one day might not be so difficult the next, uh, as threats get taken out, kind of deal, or migrate elsewhere. Um, so yeah, that would be interesting to see. Another mechanic blog. Mm -hmm. Very nifty. Cool, cool. Well, I think that wraps us up. And I uh, hope everybody had fun. I will see you guys next week. Happy Bye. Indigenous uh, People Day tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs>